I'm Mark Hennick. This is So-Called Normal. Hey folks, welcome to So-Called Normal. I'm Mark Hennick. Uh, We've got a really important episode for you today, a a really important guest. Uh, Her name is Lynn Keen. Uh, Lynn has been uh, active in the suicide prevention world in some way or another for many years. It's been more than 10 years now since her son Daniel died by suicide. Uh, And we share his story. We talk about uh, the legacy that he left and the impact that that he had, uh, both his life and his death, uh, on his mother. Uh, and and now how she's been able to to share her story through a, a TEDx Youth uh, Toronto talk, um, through her writing certainly, her advocacy work and her speaking. Uh, you know she's she's just such a powerful force, and and we had such a deep. Uh, I think, beautiful conversation and connection. She's such an easy person to connect with. So I, I hope that that comes through on on the episode today. And, and I know that there's going to be other parents listening who have also lost loved ones uh, to suicide. And I think in particular that this is this will be an important episode for you to know that uh, you're not alone, that there's others who have certainly been through this too. And, and you can find strength uh, in the community of people uh, who have been through similar adversities. I mean, that's the whole point of this show, right? There's there's, there's really no such thing as, as perfect normal. Uh, that we're all just figuring this out as we go. And, and I think Lynn, my conversation with Lynn uh, is, a, is a particularly good example of that. So, you know, hang with this episode. It's, a, it's really emotional at points, but uh, I think it's important. Uh, so here's my conversation on so-called normal with my friend Lynn Keane. So uh, thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. I, um, you know, I'm a mom. Um, I'm a... I'm now an author, a triathlete, and I'm also a survivor of suicide loss, hmm. um, which is probably one of the reasons that um, we met. Yeah. Um, uh, That's a diverse range of Because I look things. at myself as many things. And yeah. for many years after losing our son Daniel to suicide, I saw myself only as a survivor. Right. Um, it will be 10 years, April of 2019. And I thankfully see myself again as a mom. Um, you know, as, a, as as many people, not just a survivor mm-hmm. of suicide loss, but it's taken me 10 years to get there. Do you have other kids? Or? I do. I, yeah. I have a, my eldest daughter, Amy, is uh, 30 <laughs> and my youngest is uh, 24. Okay. So Daniel was the middle. No, Daniel was actually the oldest. Oh, so he was the oldest. Everybody changed. Yeah, right? oh, sure. So you're... Uh, the the middle child became the oldest, and the youngest child became my second child. So it's right. uh, it change you know changes so many dynamics that right. uh, are it's just this ball of stuff that changes when um, you know when you lose somebody suddenly, and uh, suicide just complicates it. Yeah, ten years that's a big milestone. Mm-hmm. How are you How are you feeling? I mean, it, you know, I think there the middle years um, was when I started to gather myself and and figure out. Um, you know, sort of dive back into Daniel's life and to really understand what the issues were and, and sort of his whole timeline and, and mm. try to understand that. Um, and then I think once I, I got through that, I, I, I was more accepting of his suicide because I understood to a degree that I could. Right. What were the contributing factors? What were the things as he was a young kid that changed him and, and as, as a young adult going to university? Um, and then I started to, as I said, um, you know, I was an advocate sort of from day one, not not purposely, but I think that's just where I found myself. Mm. Um, I started to find myself again. Um, so, you know, getting up to eight and nine years, I, I I did something that I never thought I would ever do in my life, but it stemmed from a conversation with Daniel. Mm. And it, back in 2008, I said, I, I want to do triathlon. And we joked about it, and he said, yeah, 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 I think you can do it. And um, so this past summer, I did an Ironman. And... Mm. Uh, I did in honor of all my family, but uh, it was that first conversation we had in 2008 that I remember. Yeah, and you made it all the way through? I finished it. You finished it as well. <laughs> 15 plus hours, but I got her done. <laughs> wow. So how long do you have to train to do an Ironman? A uh, year. Yeah. You know, a first timer, I think you really have to give yourself a year to. Uh, sure. So my coach actually said to me, um, after it was all done, it was, it was, way, it was much more than an Ironman for you. you yeah. know, it had so many other tentacles to why I would even want to start down that road. But it, for me, I think that is a really healing journey was the, sure. uh, I've always been a runner. Um, the day, the few days after um, his passing, we, I, I had to get out of the house and I just started running. Yeah. I literally put my running shoes on, 
waved my husband off because he wanted to, to drive to make sure I would be okay. And I just said, I need to go. And basically, I just started running. Did, was part of you ever feeling like you were trying to run away from oh, absolutely. what you were feeling? Yeah. I mean, that's really tied into um, the day the day that we found out that he had taken his life. Um, the, the, the sort of the, the day before, um, Daniel um, was doing some work with his dad on taxes, and he he never he had this summer business which was quite successful, but he wasn't really great at keeping track of receipts and his accounting. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he, he was fabulous with his hands. He loved working outdoors. That was his thing. So his, uh, he decided to go up north to pick up receipts and, and meet with his bank manager. And, you know, unbeknownst to us, there was a whole raft of several years that had been building up and to this mm. day. And uh, Like what? So, you know, we go back to when he was a little kid. He had asthma and anaphylaxis, uh, which... You know, today we treat those as just, you know, they're conditions, right? We just treat them. But what we what we didn't realize as young parents is that particularly asthma um, is definitely a precursor to potentially onset of adult depression. Right. It's just it's just part of the inflammation that goes through our bodies, to our brains. Yeah. Um, that was sort of the very first part. And then we, you know, we move on to um, Daniel did a lot of the extreme sports as a young guy, mm. teenager, yeah. um, probably hit his head several times. Sure. Uh, wakeboarding, snowboarding, skateboarding. Again, we weren't really cognizant of the fact that even though he may not have had a diagnosable uh, concussion, right. he certainly hit his head hard and sure. um, could have caused some some issues there. Um, he goes away to, to university and he'd never really drank or really was, he, he was into sports primarily. That's, mm-hmm. That was his life. Um, and first year, he just started falling behind, like really falling behind. Mm-hmm. And to, you know, coming from being a really good student, well liked by everybody, a good athlete, and then all of a sudden the wall came down. Mm. So you think of it, he's he's away from home, he's now having to manage all his food because he had anaphylaxis to a variety of items. Mm. You know, so he had to manage where he got the food. He couldn't just be like the rest of the guys. He couldn't just go get right. pizza. And um, were you doing that for him before? A lot of it. I mean, we were doing it as a family. We ate sure. what he ate, but um and we never really tried to draw attention to it, and he certainly didn't. But I think there was just a lot of anxiety sure. around that. But I, I think there was this um, sort of physiological changes that were happening to him as he grew up, mm. irrespective of what I even know um, or could could think of at the time. So he started missing class and mm. then he started self-medicating. And I say self-medicating. He was really going out. He was drinking, mm. something he hadn't done. But I look at it, um, it, it was sort of a way to manage his right. life there. Um, and yet, when he would come home, everything was great. And was he was he living far away? For he was in Ottawa. Okay. His, for his uh, the first university he attended was in Ottawa. So it's not like he just hop in his car and I mean easily come back. Right, that's, that's a good distance away. We we would see him during holidays. He'd come yeah. home reading week, those kinds of things, and we always made a point to spend that time together. We we kind of always were this unit of five that. As long as the kids wanted to be with us, we wanted to be with them, right. and so we did, you know traveled together, hung out a lot. And his first thing is he he text me or he call me and say, "Mom, I'm coming home. Do you want let's go shopping?" Because he loved to cook. Believe mm-hmm. it or not, he became a good cook in spite of food allergies. I, I think so. You know, we hop in the car, go get the food, and he would cook, and and we'd just sort of be gathered together. And it, it sounds very simplistic, but that was really because food food started to represent something that we could do together and and celebrate, yeah. not be afraid of. Sure. Because um, going out to restaurants was not as easy when, mm. when you've got somebody who's allergic to so many items. So so what we were seeing was primarily a normal, you know, a normal student. I did notice, though, sort of that summer after first year, um, him distancing himself from us. And actually, th- there was an agitation that I had really never seen in him because mm. he was such a great, he was just a, just easy. He was like a very easy kid to raise and... Um, mm. But what what do you mean? Well, agitation? not just like More. he would he would be pissed off at you sure. for really easy like, sure. and 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 he would go out and he would stay out late and he would you know consume a lot of alcohol and, you know when he he'd get up for, to start his business he would just be not in the best space and, right. I didn't know frankly how to manage that because I I'd not dealt with it, right. um so I mean one night I did confront him after a really bad late night of of um, carrying on and um we had a brutal fight and I just remember thinking. Something's changed. Mm. And so the next day, you know, when the dust had settled, you know, Daniel, his dad and I, we just sat and uh, we were up at the cottage and we just had a long conversation about, you know, why are you, what, what is driving this need to drink to, to, you know, sort of not function. Right. 
And um, he said he agreed. He said, you know, I think it's gotten out of hand and I, I get it. Like I get and I, I want to I want to stop it. And so th- that's kind of where we ended that summer was just kind of back on track. And um, how old was he at this point? So he I want to say um, 20, okay. maybe 20. Yeah. Um, the, the, the pivotal years I, I re- recall the most really from um, 2007 to 2009. Because we had this sort of up and down, you know, we, he, he would he would be managing and then he wouldn't. He'd be, mm-hmm. And he was never diagnosed with a condition, a mental health condition. But mm. it, it, if you read the research and if you if you looked at him, you'd say possibly bipolar because it's right. just when he was home, he was filled with mania to get stuff done. I mean, right. we were on the go. We were doing stuff. But again, we, we were looking at it as he was excited happy to be sure, home with us I and mean, sure. we weren't seeing the the downside of that which was being back at school being isolated not going to class right. um and a lot of things were sliding um even with his business now so he the what uh, was the business what did he do so it was cottage concierge it was a summer uh, maintenance business okay he started it from the ground up and had two great years and had employees um but you know regardless of what was going on everything that was part of his life was in his mind had mm. become just had just blown up yeah. and 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 because of where he was at emotionally he he felt that everything was as a result of him right and the bigger picture was he wasn't functioning because his brain wasn't helping him function you know he had sort of you know when you're in that space uh, um again this is this is hindsight this is something that sure. I, I you know i really wish i had a handle on and probably one of the reasons i was so strongly um, compelled to to speak out because i just could not believe that you'd be living or knowing somebody and then they were in such pain. Right. And that's, I think, the hardest part for me to continue to wrap my head around is, you know, watching things now from the, from the rearview mirror, I, I can see the sadness. Sure. And I, there were so many red flags, but I didn't connect anything. I, none of us in our family really, we, we, we started to understand things weren't right and we went to our doctor. And, but even at the time, if you think about 12 years ago, even, you know, the doctor basically was completely uneducated on how to to help us so you, to help us advocate. So you did talk to a doctor. I about did. It. I, I yeah. talked to my doctor about um, about his drinking, and yeah. I said, "This is not normal. How? What? What do we do?" And 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 you know, to this day, I still see that doctor, and you know, we have a relationship. But the, you know, the words that he said to me were, "Daniel will have to hit rock bottom," and and mm. those those words echo. Nobody should hit rock bottom to to begin to get help, right. least of all a young person. And do you think it was uh, it was at all kind of dismissed because he's a college student, you know, first year college student, and that's expected kind of thing? And 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 I think that we need to go back to that agitation or the sort of the, this sort yeah. of it wasn't arrogance. It was just this 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 sense of um, well, even sometimes anger. Yep. But I almost thought, is this is this the process of a young man growing up and away from me? Is that is that is this like maybe this right. is part of this? You know, we'd been sort of so hyper close, sure. a lot of it because of his allergies and stuff like that. But but a phase, you think, you know, is, is this is a this process? Normal? And I, yeah. I remember thinking that after the fact, you know, something as simple as oftentimes uh, I would drive him back to school. So he had then transferred after that first year in Ottawa. He recognized the issues. He wanted to get um, he wanted to sort of get in closer proximity to his family. So we, he was able to get into Laurier. Mm. And that seemed to be this beginning of hope again, because he got into a program he wanted to get into. Um, and at the end of it, he went to Ottawa, a lot of it probably because he thought that's what we wanted him to do. Right. I would have, in the end of the day, he wanted to work outside. That would have been his, you know, for, for you know, we're, you know, regardless of an illness, um, he was happiest outdoors, happiest doing those kinds of things, doing something that he felt that that was reward for him. Right. You know, he was also, he liked communication. So he, he got into Laurier for communications and, Things seemed to, you know, be progressing positively, and and we got to see him more, which actually was helpful because we sort of were a little, lot more aware. Sure. Um, but again, I think he was actually getting, it was sort of progressing into another area or another depth of despair. Mm. Um, you know, again after suicide, we would meet with friends at different times, and they'd say we 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 had no idea that the fact that Daniel would say we're coming out and he never would show up or he'd say he'd bail on us late or, right. and he was doing those things with us as well. But, you know, you, you can't connect every dot to suicide. You, Especially you just, not when you're in it. I mean, I, yeah. I haven't met a parent yet uh, who has lost a kid to suicide where I didn't think, 
you know, what parent would ever want to think of that as a possibility when their kid is sitting right in front of them, that one day maybe they're not. Yeah. And I don't think, um, I do now. Yeah. I, I do now. Unfortunately, I had to face that. But I, I, I think we look, we generally are hopeful people, just generally. Sure. I think that's how we get up every day and live our lives. So I don't think, as you said, I, I don't think you look for the worst in your kids. You don't right. want to go down those roads. I think one of the reasons I do speak up is because I want to thread those those series of, of I guess we'll call them events, that happened from the time he was very little and the way mm-hmm. he viewed the world because of his, particularly his anaphylaxis. Mm-hmm. But also when he was little with the asthma, he was in the hospital quite a bit. You know, sure. So those are all very early life experiences that can have an impact as, as kids grow. Yeah. I always said to DK, I called him DK, was his, his name, we always, his pet name, I guess. And I'd say... Um, I think, how would I say this? But I said, you know, kids have a lot worse and deal with it. Mm-hmm. And I like, what, what, why do we say this as parents? It's just like, it's a silly thing to say, but I think we're trying to say sure. is we get it. But at the end of the day, the world is yours. Right. You know, we'll manage this, but we're not in that person's body. We, we don't know. And, and particularly if it's psychological, that's like the absolute worst thing because you're not dealing with the person that you think you're dealing with. You're, you know, you're not dealing with, right. with the person who's functioning at a level that you, you thought you were. And so right. um, I, I really, you know, I remember when I was writing Give Sora Words, I remember thinking, what will, what will anybody remember when I speak or when I, it's like education and compassion. Cause to me, that's what we weren't able to give him was compassion mm. because we loved him so desperately, but we were like, you can do anything. Right. Right. Get it together. How is that yeah. helpful if you're not functioning? Right. So he moves over to um, to Laurier, uh, and you have this connection with him. When did things really start to to get bad, or or did you see when it really got bad and and eventually led to his death? Two thousand and eight was probably one of our best years as a family. In the sense, I'll say we were we believed Daniel was well. Hmm. Like when I say well, we 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 never had that those. A mental illness or, or even talking about mental health, really, we still weren't talking about that. Right. We yeah. certainly weren't talking about suicide. Yeah. But we, um, you know, we, we'd have these conversations. Um, I'd drive him home to, or drive him back to Laurier. I'd pick him up. And, and I remember one of our, our last drives, um, well, we thought he was at Laurier. He actually had dropped out, but we didn't know it. Okay. And he was he faked that he was still there. And so that was it. So again, all these things happened in isolation and... Um, so that's that's that said. But one day when I was driving him back, he'd said to me, you know, um, he he talked to me about friends and just how messed up they were. And and uh, I remember because in the background, the music was black from Pearl Jam. And I just went like, this song is so sad, Daniel. This is just mm-hmm. like I'm crying in the car listening to it. And, but he there, there was um, I think he was trying to talk to me. Mm-hmm. I think he was trying to tell me I am not fun- I'm not living I'm not feeling like I'm living here and mm-hmm. I don't know what's wrong. And I think he got to such a state that he was so afraid to even speak the words because he was having nightmares. He was losing weight. Mm-hmm. All of sort of the classic hallmarks we talk about now, mm-hmm. they were there. Again, we're not, we're just completely uneducated to what's going on. But I'd go into his room at night and we'd sit down and talk and, and he, you know, we'd have these conversations and said, could you, you turn that TV off? Mm-hmm. And he goes, I can't, I can't fall asleep without it. So he'd have that light on all night. So he didn't sleep. He wasn't getting mm-hmm. the sleep. So his body's not being helped. Mm-hmm. So he went from being this great you know, young athlete to, um, to being unhealthy. And so um, what I would say is there were so many points along that journey that we could have intervened. Right. And that's yeah. what sucks. And how many times have you gone over that in your head in the last 10 years? Regularly. Yeah. Like, I will, you know... <laughs> You know, probably the first three, four years, probably daily. Um, immediately, because the whole tw- 24 hours, once we didn't really realize what was happening, but um, I can go into that after. But I, it wasn't until um, we, I had uh, accepted that something had happened to Daniel, because basically he went to the cottage, as I mentioned. Um, he was coming home for dinner. We had planned dinner. We talked about four or five times that day. And then around six, seven o'clock, we started texting him saying, when are you coming back? And we were just starting to get very short, very sort of two word answers to our texts. And it was just chilling. And I, I said to my mm. husband at that time, I said, I don't, something's not right. Mm. And then it was, um, so, you know, we kept trying to communicate in it. At nine o'clock, we got the last transmission was um, heading west. 
Where was he going? So he- heading west would have been coming, or heading home, heading west. Um, right. And this had, you know, so it, by this time we're like, look, we'd made dinner, like we'd made dinner plans. We were all going to be together. And then he decided to go to see somebody and it was, but he never really left the cottage, mm. you know? So what had ever had, you know, again, it, this, this is years, but what had ever started to transpire on that afternoon, mm-hmm. it was a late April day, the skies got dark. And I think the, the, you know, um, you know, he had moved from ideation to, yeah. and and I look at, you know, again, from, from reading and from doing research and talking to specialists, it's um, it's a very short window. Yeah. Between, to, you, to your knowledge, did he have prior attempts or? I did not. Yeah. I, um, I do believe that he tried to stay here as long as he could. Sure. But I don't, I would have no knowledge of that. Yeah. You know. You, you mentioned yeah. that you talked a number of times that day. Um, yeah. What did you talk about? Do you remember the last time that you spoke to him? Oh, like it was yesterday. I mean, we, I, again, I had started swimming with these triathlon groups and I was saying, I got in the water and I was doing this, this, and this. He was always like, he was always such a big cheerleader of everybody. And so he was just, the the conversations up until four o'clock were like, just what's for dinner. Mm -hmm. And and actually he said, you know, I've had time to, when I drove up to the cottage, it's about a two hour drive. He said, I've had time to really reflect on, and those are his words, reflect on, you know, these past years. And I really want to make this a great summer. Mm. And I, I think in my mind, he was trying so hard to get to that summer. And, the, you know, by the time he, by the, he, he just, he just could not get there. And um, so we basically waited up all night just trying to reach him. And we asked a neighbor, is there any lights on? Because he can sort of mm-hmm. see over. And he said, I'll go first thing in the morning. And um, we got the police involved and we sent a picture and... um. Life changed, and I knew, I knew, I knew around when when I tried to sleep that night. I knew, I knew this was not good because this was just so not. No matter what had happened in our life with our kids, nothing had ever come close to not being able to connect with them, losing touch, and and I think I probably always feared Daniel for Daniel just because of his allergies. I think I always, you know. You've got to keep an EpiPen around and you've got to sort of have that sort of extra sense about a kid that's, that's you know, lives with certain conditions. Right. So I probably always had this little more heightened awareness. And it was just at the time I started to let that go. I was like, he's on his own. He's cooking his food. He's doing what he needs to do. He's like on a mission. Um, he's got clients for this business. He's he's doing well. And it, it was just like, it's like I let, you know, my foot off the gas. And, and I know that's just sort of a... a a way to deal with things internally. But I, I, I remember thinking that year I started to have the, this sense of calm that he was, right. he was, he was able to look after himself. Uh, um, and he had, he had for years. It was just my own anxiety, I think was less. So when, when did you find out? So the next morning, my husband dropped my daughter off, my youngest to uh, school. We, we, like we were, we were a mess. We weren't even speaking because we knew it was like this, um, if we spoke to one another, it would make, it, it, it would just, it's like double the pain. Right. And I, we just, like, there was no way to communicate to each other. So we basically went to sleep in silence, woke up in silence. I literally got up and took my dog to the park and it was by Lake Ontario. And I just kept walking. And you talked earlier when we started talking about running away. Right. That's when I began running. Really? I, I began physically running from what was coming. And I knew... I knew it wasn't going to be good. I didn't, I, but even up until like that, at that moment, I still had no sense that, that this could be, um, any part of our life. I, I just, I thought, I thought he was in a car accident. I thought everything else, but right. lost by suicide. Right. So my husband did get a call from our neighbor because when our neighbor walked over there, he found Daniel. Right. And that neighbor, I mean, we, we were always connected. Um, we're connected for life. Um, and he was always so close with Daniel. And um, he called my husband and just said, you know, the news isn't good. And so uh, my husband's trying to frantically get a hold of me, and I, I won't answer the phone. Hmm. And I finally picked it up, and um, he said the news isn't good to me, and I, I just lost it. And I, I think it was like I, I said, I don't, I don't want to know anymore. Hmm. I get, I get that Daniel's gone. I don't want to know anymore. 
And it wasn't until later that afternoon when we'd all kind of gotten back to the house. We'd picked Amy up because she was at a, another university and Emily was home. And um, I just went outside to be in the backyard because I, I just knew I, I felt some connection to nature that I'd never felt before. And um, Amy walked outside and put her arm on my shoulder and she said, you're going to make something come of this. And at that moment, I knew it was suicide. Mm. And also at that moment, I had absolutely no sense of shame. I just thought, my God, you were in such pain. Right. And your family couldn't help you. But I never had a sense of anything more than that at the moment. Had you um, had any prior exposure at this point to mental health, talking about mental health, suicide, anything like that? Like, what did you believe about suicide at that time? So this kind of converged with, so it was 2009, so 2008 was the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of stuff going on in the world, just generally, and there was a, it was like a really negative time. I remember that mm -hmm. we, we, as a family, would talk about the things that were happening in the world and the financial crisis, and, and there was a person in our community who took his life. Mm -hmm. And I remember having conversation on the sofa with Daniel, and I was sitting in the chair, and he's on the sofa, and I, I just said, I, I, I don't even understand. Up until that point, I don't even think I had written the word suicide right? or had a conversation about it. And I said, you know, and he had family and he had kids. And I, I said, I just don't, I have no understanding that what would bring a person to that point. And Daniel looked at me and said, how could he, how could he leave his kids? And that was kind of our conversation. Right. So it, it really shows me that, the, the point when a person is at that that sort of a complete loss of hope wasn't even – he wasn't saying that for my benefit. He was no. saying that because that's what he believed sure. at the time. And when you get into that place, I mean, having been there myself, I can't speak for everybody, but you get yeah. so uh, neurologically, emotionally, and otherwise so – blinded so mm -hmm. focused in on that one thing that it's the only thing you can see you can't even see what you used to believe or what you might believe there's it, only that feeling yeah. in that moment so i so you know i i you know then the, our world literally it was like a bomb was dropped and i i remember um you know then going to, to a couple of days later i i went for a run and i i i just wailed at the world and i i you know for for probably for 2 years I became socially isolated myself. Mm -hmm. I, I really, because the people I knew in my prior life knew our family. Right. And now that we weren't intact, this is the way I kind of looked at it at mm -hmm. that point, was we weren't whole. Um, I didn't want to see them because I didn't want to remember what it was like to be that way. Right. It was such a bizarre. And I, I really felt I got as close to a grief-driven driv depression as one could be. And I, I um, you know, I had my own thoughts. I started to think, well, if the, if Daniel's not here, I can't, like, how can I live in a world without my son? Mm. And, you know, that that's, so there's a whole other side of that is that, you know, you, you're, you're not rational at all. And, sure. and sadly, the outside world doesn't really know how to help you. They, they do what they can. And, and I did have some wonderful and great people that, you know, stood there as I just melted. But, um, honestly, you got to find a way to start facing it and walk to the pain. And, I think after staying in bed for the better part of two years and mm. being completely isolated, I, um, you know, people, I would hear things, you know, sort of, um, and, and I, again, I know people did things for, for my benefit, um, but they were so misplaced, like, you, you got to get strong for your kids. Well, right. you got to get strong for yourself. And if you can't, you, you're, you're no good to yourself or anyone else. So I really... My kids and my husband, I think we all kind of went in our own way. And, and that's the other thing is when you're in such deep grief, you can't help each other. Right. Even though you're still in, in that same building together, that house, there's no, um, there's just no allowance for, for, for being empathetic to someone else's pain. Cause you just, you just, you, you've lost, you've lost whatever skills that you had once yeah. and, and everything you believed is gone. Yeah. And were you still, yeah. were you working at that point as well? So um, I, 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 I sort of, in my former life, was a sports uh, journalist at CBC. No, I, I sort of left that world yeah. and kind of was doing my own thing. And um, 
I really got into doing marathoning kind of as my job, but right. I was doing other things. Um, and I, I'm, I also had a, a long time event that I do for uh, Campu right. So we do a road race up in Muskoka and I had become the race director. Wow. And uh, we just hit 15 years this year, but Daniel and all the rest of our family, you know, basically did all the work for that race for years. So, uh, you know, that year I couldn't even do that race. I had to punt it over to my partner up there to to, to manage it. But, um, you know, it's basically raise, you know raising the rest of the kids that, you know, getting my youngest off to, to university just, or she was only 15 at the time of the loss. So, um, how did, how did yeah. you, you know, cause you're still a mother, right? Yeah. So, so that question then that, that, that was misplaced of still being there for your other kids. How did you, how did they get through it? How did you get through it together yeah. as a family? So bizarre as it sounded, I think that the one thing that we did kind of early on, I mean, so this happened in April. So May 24th was the first sort of holiday, I guess, or mm-hmm. event that we would come together. And we decided to go up to Blue Mountain mm. just to go just to get out of the house. It's the worst thing we ever did. Mm. It's again, when you're running, when, we weren't necessarily physically running away at that point, but we, we knew we couldn't be in places where we had been before. We couldn't go back to the cottage at all. Mm-hmm. We couldn't be in the house. And we all got there and we sat there and we thought, we can't do this. So we, we stayed one night and turned around and came home. And we, we said, okay, what can we, do? What, what is it we can do that, can just lift us up for an hour. Like, so mm-hmm. we started watching 30 Rock on television. Mm-hmm. And honestly, the act of laughing mm-hmm. when you're in, when you're a mess is like the best nice. the, the comedy is a healing outlet. And so we, we then, then, then we became, um, you, you become like, com, com, um, what's the word? Um, <laughs> like you, you compulsive. You need it. You need it because you knew that fixed you for an hour. Right. I need more of it. Right. So you become sort of fixated on what can you get next to give you a bit of happiness. So that was sort of the like uh, uh, opening to sort of softening in, in your grief. Right. But Mark, it's it's uh, each one of us has found a way in in and not the same ways, and it certainly has never happened at the same time. Mm-hmm. We're all still managing um, our own grief, and then trying to understand where everybody is now, ten years after. Right. And, and so it's it's an ongoing, it's ongoing, and and um, you know, I I just recently decided that. I need to know where I'm at in right. 10 years. So I started talking again to somebody because I think it's like, I've really been managing almost, like, why am I managing this well? And I've started to question mm. my good health, my good mental health. And I and not question in a way that I think it's wrong. I just, I think what I want to question is, I did the grief work for many, many years and I think it led me to a point, but then, then I started to carry on with that other life, and I mm-hmm. want to understand where at ten years, have I put it somewhere? Is it? Do I need? You know, these are very sort of esoteric questions, but I, I need to understand where I'm at. I, yeah. You know, at in ten years. Do you? Was there a point in your in your recovery where you felt like you you had let it go that you had moved on? Have you reached that point? I, I, I never said, move, like, I can't ever say moved on. I right. think there's like a physical moving away from Daniel, but I think in, in the, in the ways that we say that, I think, yes. Right. And I, I well, think, cause there's, yeah. I find that in grief, there's always that, I can only speak to my own experience, but there's a hesitance to let go of that old life yeah. because, and start something new, uh, start a new life because it means you're starting a new life without that person in it anymore. And you, and in the, yeah, and in the ways ready for that sometimes. Yeah. Right. I think I probably, um, so we stayed in our, our home, our, our home that Daniel lived in, um, for, let's see, about five years, no longer than that. We stayed in our house for several years after, and purposely, we, we, well, first of all, we weren't in any position to, to start to pack up his room or anything. Mm -hmm. And so very, very slowly, I started to go into his room and just start to shift things around because for many years, I kept everything intact. Really? Yeah. That was a necessary uh, thing because it was it, it it was a place I could still go right. that had his memories very vividly. The smells. The smells. I mean, to this day in his hat collection, I can, it's him. I still have his, you know, and I, I have his t-shirts and my, you know, we, we, I don't look like look at any of it. It's like what whatever it is you need. And I always say this to people: if you need something, and you may you may have thought in your other life this is odd, go for it. Right. It's something you need. If you need it that badly, then there's a reason that you've hung on to something. Right. And yes, over the years we've let go of, um, you know, we've moved houses, and so now the house we in, house we're in now does not have a 
a room for Daniel. We'll say a bedroom right. has less rooms. Was there a moment though that it's hard? It's, yeah, that you oh, realize that that yes. maybe you weren't expecting that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and it was like hit me like very hard because I I think when you're at the moment of saying okay, I'm, I'm ready for this change, and then it's almost like you're after after you've made the decision. I think like, he's not going to have a room here. Hmm. But you know, I don't even look at his gravesite as where he resides. I mean, right. to me, he resides in the in our life and our memories and 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 very viscerally in in moments in my life that I go. Okay. All right. I get it. And I and I often thought um, when I really got into doing a lot of the mental health advocacy and suicide prevention, I got so deep into it. And I would say to him, like, you're going to give me a sign, right? When I when I can maybe back off and maybe mm. give it to somebody else, because because there are times, and, and you know yourself, like you there that you have to protect yourself, sure. and so you've got to you, you you can you, giving of your your own real truths are is like. It's uh, life affirming, but it's also can be very difficult and there's a price you pay and I, I'm better at it now. But mm. early on, I, I, I'd come home from things or talks or whatever. I was just like in bed yeah, because because you were you're so raw about and, and, and then it sort of re, it sort of re, kind of triggers things again. So I'm I'm much better at handling that now. Yeah. Tell me about the the stages of grief. Um, did that you know, in, in terms of denial and anger and, um, uh, you know, some the, I've experienced all of them, but <laughs> they, they don't feel that way when you experience it. No. Does that hold true when you lose somebody to suicide as well in terms of, you know, they, they say that you don't move through them necessarily in a linear kind of way that they happen all over the place. But was that a, your experience as well? So, so to go back to this um, running away theme, I think that's what I was most afraid of hmm. was I didn't know what was coming next because I'd never experienced, I'd never lost anybody that close to me. Right. Um, it, so I didn't understand, I didn't have any sense of what to expect. But for, for me, it was, um, it was, it would be all things at once or one thing. It was, it was just yeah. very um, fluid. I would cry and then I re would remember having a respite for maybe five minutes. Hmm. The, the physical act of crying um, sort of, changed up it just gave you like a window of peace mm. also uh, again through grief i found really helpful was reading reading other stories mm -hmm. not necessarily of suicide but of loss of, of like catastrophic loss I, just to understand that they they were able to survive right so i read a lot like in the first year i can't even count how many books i read i just was ravenous again of trying to trying to understand how people coped and managed but in terms of my personal um, way through was 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 once I started walking towards it and it and it hit me hard that was the way I could manage it because you right. denial I think comes up real fast I think the denial was like the the night of mm -hmm. um, one and then then I believe shock is a protective coating sure, yeah. covering that stays for a few days and it's like thankfully you have that because um i think it allows you to manage to make arrangements to do the things that you have to do when someone dies quick very suddenly when it goes all i can tell you is when we closed the door after the service and we had had a few people together for a little uh it wasn't a celebration it was just a gathering we came home shut the door and the pain in the house was something I've, I, I, I can't, to this day when I know someone has lost somebody and it's not necessarily a sudden death or a mm. tragic, I just know when that part is done, the next part is the hardest work you'll ever do in your life. Yeah. The day after the funeral, basically, when every, all the, all the casseroles go away, everybody's gone. Yeah. And it's it's just, such a loneliness that yeah. you just... Yeah, there's no, I mean, all I can say is you, you, I mean, for me, because I, I think I still didn't have the, um, the ability to, you know, to say the way I could say now, you know, I, I would read something and I'll, I'll feel better. Mm -hmm. Back then I didn't know what I was doing. So I, right. I, I, I relied on a grief counselor, um, and sleep mm -hmm. and to the degree I could on my family. And mm -hmm. I think we were all the same. And, and I literally stayed in bed so I could I could sleep. I just felt sleeping. I didn't have to live with the present. Mm -hmm. um, not a great way to function for very sure. long because you, you, 
it's, you're not going to get well. So when did when did that start to turn around where you started to get yourself out of bed more yeah. and and So I you know I did have a dog right. so I had to walk the dog so I would mm. I would get up try to get myself together put on my sunglasses and just go for a walk and um again I I was I was did not want to run into anybody. I just again I didn't feel I never felt the shame of what my son why of his passing the suicide what what struck me was his pain, but I didn't want to have to explain to anybody what mm-hmm. I, I I had no words for anybody, and um, and I don't know you know you, do you know if people are watching I don't know but you, you feel this like you feel like you have a spotlight on you when you're walking around and it, I think it's again it's your mind is playing tricks but I remember the I don't know why this memory stands out but uh, I lost my mother very suddenly a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. And it's burned into my memory the first time I rode the subway after losing my mother. Uh, came, went back to Cape Breton, did all of the stuff, uh, mm-hmm. came back to Toronto about three, three weeks later, I'd say. And I had that exact same fi- feeling, just sitting on the subway, thinking, oh, this is time to go back to real life and mm-hmm. all these people going about their business. Right. And yeah. I just started crying on the subway. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I, d- I didn't know what to do with myself. Yeah. So I can relate to that yeah. experience. It's just so You're so separate strange. from the So norm. separate. Yeah. Like, you're in a little bubble and yeah. everybody else is just going on yeah. with their life. How are you just moving about the day? Yeah. And I'm stuck here. And Again, I, I think it's the process of, of, of grieving and we as mourners, um, and I, I think the Hebrew um, Kaddish speaks to it. It's just you have to allow, there is grace in mourning. And, mm. and when you start to feel that grace, you, you, you recognize the deeper I get in this, the, the better I'm going to be. The, 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 the more deeply I mourn you, my son, the healthier I will end up on the other side. Again, I don't think at the mm-hmm. time I had that reference. No, but you, you but do I could enter feel, into it, sure. I knew, and I think that sort of was probably, um, you asked me about the time, it's probably, you know, I mean, I, I, I did get out of bed. I did do, right. I did function, you know, I had to make dinner or had to make breakfast for, for my daughters, but I, I would retreat a lot. And then I think probably at the two-year mark, I started to retreat less. And it was probably around the one-and-a-half-year mark I started writing Mm. and the writing was really that elixir that just because I could write to Daniel not writing for anybody but myself and I would I would I would actually literally hear his I could hear his voice Mm -hmm. and I could see him walk with this like he had this like maybe he thought he was cool but he never acted like it but he just had this sort of very natural affinity to look cool all Mm -hmm. the time and he always wore flip-flops even in the winter so I like I would see those things in my mind's eye and I I I would make me laugh and and so I, I just kept writing about him, and then I also wanted to write because I was starting to get paranoid that I would I would lose my memory of those mm. things. You don't, but I, again, not knowing anything, I I started to write about him, and sort of in the physical sense. And then I started, I turned some corner, and I thought, no, I need to now find out why, mm-hmm. as best I can. And that's when I went to Dr. Roger McIntyre in Toronto. I basically, uh, through a friend, got in. He said, "I give you an hour. What do you need?" And I, I said. This is what I think I know. Where do I go and find research? So he's just pointing me down roads to start to 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 read the research of suicidologists, mm-hmm. and you know. And then one day, 2015, I found myself standing in front of a group of suicidologists at a conference in New York, and I'm going, "In my, like, well, how am wow. I here? How did that invitation come out?" Um, so the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, I guess, had seen some online work and invited me to speak. It was just so bizarre that because of our experiences, they were they were reaching out to survivors. Right. Um, I spoke, but there were other survivors there, and they were. And then we we were also on a panel. And they wanted to understand from our experience, and I think that's that was just to me. It was just so incredible that they were actually, sure. you know moving away from just the research and wanting to have the experiential understanding right. as well. who the research impacts. Exactly. You know? And then when did the TED Talk come along? That was 2014. Yeah. That was, um, so TEDx actually reached out to me. Um, was They just said, you know, your name came up. Um, we have 12 people on this panel that day, or not panel, but the, the way they work, they have uh, a group of about 12 people. Mm-hmm. Um, we'd like you to be one of our speakers. Mm. And they said, so this is the format what do you think? And I, again, it, it was able, it was a point where I was able to sort of shrink my experience into 17, 18 minutes. Mm-hmm. 
And I'd never done anything like that. And it was just, you know, I was so nervous. Like, I literally, I remember before I was called to go on, I was sitting with my daughter and her girlfriend and um, just like, how am I going to do this? And there was 250 kids from all across Toronto um, were invited to this day of mm. talks. And I just remember thinking, what, what a, this moment was a seminal moment in, in just my journey because mm. The kid, they were just so honest yeah. and and so open and their expressions were what their expressions were going to be. They didn't hold back. <laughs> and I, I felt empowered then because I thought, because you heard my story, I've given you something. Mm. And I felt like I, like because they were there, I could feel that, that something had transpired. Yeah. So those kinds of moments, reaching out, especially to young people, just... Um, are my inspiration to 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 continue yeah. and and frankly Daniel hasn't given me a sign yet so uh, I'm still at it. Keep chugging <laughs> along, yeah. So then the book. So you you you. It sounds like you're using writing and speaking and advo- and discovering advocacy as partly a way to cope and to help others. So then, how did the book uh, come about? Um. So again, through the writing, I I ended up um, decided to take a, a course at Humber. It was or like a writer's workshop, and I met Miriam Taves. Oh, the okay. author, just by fluke, she happened to be my teacher for the week. Oh, wow. So basically, you, you're, you're called to bring 10 pages of writing. Right. So these first pages were, turned out to be the first pages of the book. Right. And so we workshopped them among eight or so people. And turns out she was a, a suicide survivor. Really? Um, yeah. Her father and her sister. Wow. And I think recently she's written actually um, to that, um, especially about her sister. And she got my work in advance, so she didn't, we hadn't, you know, we had never had a conversation. And then uh, we just happened to be in the ladies' room on the morning of, and she's just, we stopped and we talked and we hugged. Hmm. And she said, I, I get your story, so let's go do some writing. And that, those first pages actually were, um, so I kind of just kind of kept those pages. And no matter what I had to do, even if the book changed completely, I knew mm-hmm. those pages were pivotal to getting someone to enter my story. Mm-hmm. Because it isn't a story... Uh, about um, it's just one family story, and it's a, it's a sort of a, a fully kind of a complete story of a family, as opposed to um, you know, and, and hopefully you'll someone will understand something through it about the, the process when someone's suffering from a, a mental health condition mm-hmm. or living with severe anxiety and depression, whatever it is, and suicide loss. But but it's really at the core; it's just a family story, and I think you know I've I've been I've tried to start writing. I've written a lot since then, but not in book format and I think I think to myself just go back to those eight to ten pages mm-hmm. just write a few pages because mm. that's your start doesn't have to be the book yeah, <laughs> right yeah. and I know you, I know you're yeah. writing a book or just publishing try, a book try, trying to <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know 10 years in I mean what do you know now 10 years later uh, you and your family what have you learned in the last 10 years that you that that you would have told yourself on that mm. day when you found out about losing your son mm. You know, live every day, you know, I think that's, you know, but I would say the one thing I've, I've come out of this experience is I recognize that when we can engage others in our stories, we actually empower people. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel, I don't know that I would have ever had that thought before. I think I was just, you know, kind of going around with my life. It was kind of good things, you know, you had up and downs, like all families do, you had struggles, you had triumphs really didn't look up to see what the heck was going on in my life. And, you know, maybe maybe being more present um, is part of it. But mm. I can't spend the rest of my life beating myself up for things I wasn't aware of. But I, I certainly will always have a pain because, uh, like a sadness, a deep sadness sure. in my heart because I, you know, for as connected as we were and are, I couldn't help Daniel in his toughest period of time Mm. Um, because I was just I was sort of getting little parts of this big painting and I wasn't getting the full but I wasn't getting it because I didn't understand and I think if as a parent you have um, you have at the at the at the least an awareness of your kids trajectory their their life experiences as a young person sort of where they're at Mm. um, changes to behavior is huge leaving school, changes in diet and sleeplessness, mm. those are all, just taken on their own are, are, are warnings that, you know, you, your family member isn't functioning um, yeah. what, at whatever age. Well, I, I hope this doesn't sound 
uh, I hope this sounds the way that I mean it, but but something that I've often wondered in myself too is, would you have learned that lesson had he not died? Had you not lost him? Would you have learned what you know now? Not to say that, that it needed to happen or that no. it was good, but would you have learned that? You know, I'd say yes. And here's why I would say that. Because from a very young age, I was Daniel's advocate. Right. I had always been his advocate with allergies. We set up seminars in our house with the, the allergists. We, m- most of my life with Daniel was around advocacy. Sure. So, And when I walked into my doctor's office and uh, Daniel was two years old, it was the allergist, and he said, your son could die from ingesting a peanut. Mm. Uh, what? And so I, from a very young age, I was very aware of that I had to try somehow to keep him safe. I, I I didn't have those discussions in my mind about, you know, how do I help his mental health? Right. Never had that. It was always around his physical health. Right. So I think, Mark, to to be true, because I had to be an advocate from sure. very young, I think, you know, I, I think I would have got it. Um, you know, life is, life, this experience has changed us all. Certainly not for the better. We've, I mean, the fact that we're, we're, you know, that my husband and I are still together, the fact that my kids have gone on to, to do kind of great things, that's a testament to, uh, you know, I don't even, I don't know what, you know, Daniel's up there, the great, you know, divine. I, but, you know, we've suffered. And I, I know those, you know, anybody that's gone through things like yourself, your your struggles, your journey, sometimes you have to stop and say, I've learned a lot through this process. Um, I'm not necessarily a better person, but because of what I know, I can make a difference. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, there's the gift. Mm-hmm. That is, the, the, it, it, in all this horror and tragic circumstances, I think that's what I would say is, um, yes, A, I think I would have caught it or understood this, but we didn't get that chance. Um, so now my opportunity is to change the life of someone else. Well, this is it. And it's not to... I always hate when people silver line things on me and and try right. to tell me to look at the good side and all this because it doesn't work when you're yeah, well, when you're yeah, in the but yeah, yeah. but I think that when presented with difficult circumstances, what else are you gonna do? Like what what do you? This right. is I can do something with this or I can stay in bed. Yeah, right. And I and I've done all. And yeah, well, this so, is it. Yeah. And there's a time and to do yeah. all of that yeah. stuff. But it's like when I wake up in the morning, what now? Yeah. Right. What else is there? You know, I find out. Uh, I, I think I really, I really learned early on in this process. When um, uh, so the first m- few months, I started writing. Actually, I, I and I wrote a piece that got published. In fact, an argument, and it was mourning our two Daniels, mm-hmm. and I, that was sort of my first recognition that there are other people that have gone through the same thing. Right. But I also saw some really negative, like weird. I thought, like that happens. I guess that's actually part of this too. Mm. But that was probably, and that was. That was September of 2009, so it was very early on. But I think, you know, when I when I said it probably took me longer, but I, that was the first recognition that I a I wasn't alone in this this. Mm. Um, so keep doing what you're doing because people would say like that. You, thank you for saying our, or speaking our story. Mm-hmm. That is exactly what we experienced. I just didn't know what to say about it. Yeah. And um, if if you if you've got that ability to have a voice. You don't you don't have a sense of how many people you're speaking for, yeah. you know, um, and changing changing something. Well, and this has been my experience too, right? You're not going to be speaking to everybody, but the people that you do speak to, they're 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 listening. Yeah. Then there's a lot of them out there. Yeah. I know that you've impacted so many parents, especially who have lost a loved one to suicide, a kid to suicide, mm-hmm. something so unthinkable, and yet here you are running through it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still and I'm still. Uh, yeah, but I, you know, that day, that 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 day in in uh, July this year was, um, you know, I started the swim and I at, at, at Lake Placid, and I remember my first thought was Daniel as I got into the water. I, the, 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 just you know, sort of context, the start of an Ironman is always frenetic, and at mm. the water, everybody's like, even the good swimmers are panicking, <laughs> and it's like it's just this energy. And I thought, I kind of went into my own zone, and um, my whole the rest of my family was with me, but I went into the water and just said, just you know my least of all loved events and I get in the water and I just had this Zen and that was just like, mm. like, you know, we were together and uh, got out of the water, got back in, did the second loop. And my, I remember my youngest saying to me, what did you do? You got out of the water and you waved to the diver and <laughs> took a sip of water and went back in. I said, I don't, I don't even remember. Mm. I was, um, 
which speaks to the power of where we can come from or go right. to even even in our worst there is an ability for grace and life and well and so. what a great i can't think of a better an analogy for grief than an iron man competition where you're just flailing and panicking in the water at first struggling to keep your head above mm. the water it's, uh, it's pain it's just yeah. a day of pain and uh being buoyed up by people all, all day it's uh, it is a, a kind of a metaphor for and, and i think that's what my coach alluded to is i think for you this was much more than a right. than us than a, you know just going to to get a spot to Kona, it was really just to to get in there and and push your body to to yeah. to parts you've never been to. So so then conti- maybe continuing that metaphor, I don't know, but what did you feel when you crossed the finish line? A sense of relief and just this uh, joy that I had have never. I've never felt, uh, you know, you have joy when you have your children and you have joy in different moments. But this kind of joy was because because I knew I didn't get there alone. Mm. And I, I knew that the people closest to me um, were with me the whole day. Daniel included. Daniel included. And all the folks back home that were watching me on the app. And, and I just knew that I, there was so much love. Like, I literally felt that love all day. So it was... There was so much joy, and even it, even when the day was just sucking, like I knew the sun was going to go down, and I was going to finish in the dark. I kind of knew that anyway. But those last two k were magic, and I, I thought you're just aware that there's so much good left. Like there's so many things to, to still be done, and um, you know, I it was euphoric. And I, I remember waking up the next day because I think that I think we we went to have something to eat, and then I just passed out. I was so tired and. The next day I woke up and I, I said to my girls, they kind of were looking like this, shaking their heads. I said, I think I want to try to qualify for Kona. And they're like, I, we knew you'd say that. We knew that's the next step. Because so, that was never in my, uh, right. you know, my uh, my future. But, you know, you, uh, you you do what's in front of you. So, What would you say to a parent who's just embarking, uh, just at the starting line of losing a kid to suicide? <sighs> As somebody who's been to the finish line. I wish we could catch them before the start. Mm. I really hope that, that that we've learned a lot. But if you um, are finding yourself in those early days of loss through suicide, uh, particularly of a child, I would say um, right now the most important thing is you. And you really have to make space for the pain. It's just it's 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 the worst visceral a sense of loneliness and um, loss of everything you've believed in, but allow yourself to slowly walk towards it because there is there's there is there's hope and there's life and there is there is joy on the other side of that. But but it takes a lot of time. It's just um, it's it just it, I think we want things to be better and mm. we 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 don't live in a world where we where we want to stay in pain for five years, six years. We, But I think when you lose a child, you have to allow the, t- the, the just, there's no speeding through it. It's just, and honestly, I think it allows you to stay, you stay so connected to them. Even in the pain, there's a connection. And, and when you love, it'll hurt. There's, there's no way around it. But there is hope on the other side. Lynn, thank you so much for coming in and talking to me. It's you're such an inspiration to me personally, and I hope that you continue to run the race, <laughs> that you continue to share your story and, and help so many people. Thank you, Mark, and, and you inspire me. Thank you. With that, uh, I, you know, I hope you go back and listen to some of the other episodes as well that we've done so far. We've got lots more coming for you uh, that are that are you know a, a wide range of, of different topics, you know, ranging from suicide uh, to to comedians and and television personalities and so many others to show that uh, we really do have this common link uh, uh, between each other in terms of how we deal with with struggle and how we build this thing that we call normal. So uh, head on over to Apple Podcasts, uh, subscribe to the show, uh, leave us a rating uh, if, if you like, and, and some comments in the bottom. That would be that would be great. I mentioned to follow me on social media as well, uh, but you can go to my website too, markhennick.com slash so-called normal. Uh, read more about the show, more about me, what I do, how to contact me, uh, all that stuff. 
Uh, if you want to try out some free, safe, effective psychotherapy, go to betterhelp.com slash mark. Enter the promo code mark, my name, M-A-R-K, uh, and you can try out a free trial uh, with uh, with trained, credentialed uh, psychotherapists uh, and from the comfort of your own home at that. You can do it right from your right from your phone in the comfort of your own home. So go check that out, betterhelp.com slash mark. That's it for me, Mark Hennick. This has been So-Called Normal. Normal.